Hey guys, welcome to our webinar. So as always, we're going to be starting uh, with a little bit of an introduction. So my name is Michael and um, I am a teacher for this academy. And this academy is an online school that will teach you how to create a beautiful visualizations in less than seven weeks. Uh, because right now you can even see some of our students' works on our Instagram, which I would definitely recommend you to uh, check out. Uh, so welcome everybody. It's so nice to see that uh, our audience, as always, is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, each webinar, we're uh, getting more uh, of you guys interested in topic of 3ds Max which is amazing to see. So uh, once again, if you want to learn how to create visuals, uh, just like our students, uh, feel free to join Viz Academy um, online training. And uh, without any further ado, let's just uh, talk a little bit about what we were what we are going to do today. So the topics that I want to go over with you today are quite simple but still troublesome to some uh, of the students and i want to make sure that we're going to be able to go over all of that okay so i can see that uh, we've got quite a lot of you guys um active on our chat so uh clody cad uh, asim arch um myri peter melod oh hello melod uh, mauro raimondo welcome uh, nice to see you and also Pixel, Bilek, uh, Sal Salia, Dick, and uh, we've got MKV, uh, Maria. So welcome everybody. Also, if you haven't said hello, feel free to say that. Also, you can just say a plus in our chat. That's also going to be super appreciated to see that you guys are online. Uh, so my first question is, what is your typical way of creating bricks in 3ds Max? or for any project whatsoever. I know you're probably going to tell me that you typically use textures and there is no nothing wrong with that. Uh, because whenever we want to work with some kind of shapes, typically your bricks are going to be quite easy uh, to do because when the shape is just a flat wall, it would be ridiculous to model each brick step by step. But Sometimes it's not going to be possible due to the fact that our reference is going to require few more tricks or few more steps. And we want to make sure that whenever we will be working with those, we want to have that extra something in our at our disposal. As always, I am absolutely unprofessional by leaving my phone um, with sound on, which I apologize for. Uh, but uh, okay hello sir hi hi uh, only pbr maps that's actually really good but uh, pbr maps tend to be quite troublesome when you have to customize them or do something that's not really going to be exactly what this texture was designed for so we're going to try to do something different today but let's start with the most basic way of creating our bricks and that's going to be just a texture with some setup but um you obviously know that 3ds max and corona are absolutely simple uh, so we want to make sure that whenever we work with 3ds max we not uh, we don't necessarily go for the most elaborate uh, solution that you can think of because honestly there are two ways of doing your materials so this is what i'm going to show you as useful and everything we need to know today and this is a material created by one of my students and to be honest uh, this material is a huge overkill but at the same time it was pretty much bulletproof and uh, she was able to use this for pretty much any surface and it was just uh, just working perfectly uh, so we're going to go for the light version without really going into details but i'm going to make sure that you understand and i'm going to give you some tips that may make you your material a bit more uh let's say bulletproof and uh, versatile uh, so hello how are you long time hope you remember me um ahmed i do i do and you were 
weren't you part of a group like uh, six months ago? Um, I remember you, so really nice to see you. Uh, displacement map. Displacement maps, that's also a nice way of doing that. PBR maps and bricks. Hi, Mike. Uh, hi, Ricardo. Uh, just a texture with displacement, but sometimes it's a mess. It can be. Uh, can this, can this uh, be done without floor generator? Because I want to use it. I have 3ds Max 202012. Okay, 202012. Yes, we can do it, and I'm going to show you how to do it. But you're not going to, and you're not going to need any kind of floor generators. But floor generator is one of our options. So let's start with the simplest, easiest way of doing bricks. And I'm going to uh, quickly create a simple wall. And because I most importantly want to show you that you don't need to go for super, um, let's say, professional techniques that require five years of training before you really get into modeling something nice. No, uh, 3ds Max and Corona are simple and I absolutely am a huge fan of doing things the simplest way possible. So in 3ds Max, and especially once you install Corona, and I know that everybody here is going to probably use Corona or V-Ray. So we've got those two options. We can either go for our Corona material library, which is built in Corona, and it kind of tends to be slow when you first open it once you work with 3ds Max. But we've got a plethora of different textures and different materials that are basically going to be perfect for what we need. And in many cases, walls, wood, stones, Whatever you're going to be needing, it's probably going to be there, fast and easy to use. Those textures are typically going to be pretty prepared and uh, for uh, real world scale, which is also uh, let's um, it is which is also workflow for the dum dums. And uh, I'm going to try to make sure that everybody understands why in a couple of seconds. Our second option for the fastest way of creating bricks is obviously Chaos Cosmos, which is going to be part of uh, Corona forever now. So all we need to do is select our material and just uh, add it into our scene. But sometimes it's going to be nasty and it's not going to allow you to just drag and drop the material. So we're going to try to drag and drop it into our material editor first. And we're going to quickly see that this material, although very good looking, can give us a few uh, problems. Why? Because not only it's needlessly complicated and uh, not only we're not going to understand everything, it's going to require a few additional clicks, which we already covered in previous webinars, how to avoid as many clicks in our materials when using 3 planner map. Uh, but um, whenever you have a brick wall, you, will t uh, you often will run into an issue that everything is just too uniform. And from time to time, you want to have a little bit of a problem. Uh, one or two bricks could be a bit uh, deeper and uh, your displacement map is not necessarily going to be covering that. When you want to have your perfect map, or let's say your perfect uh, render, you first probably think that, okay, texture is going to be enough and that's all I need to do. But you can even see that this texture has a very high degree of um, re repetition. So it was pre-made or made from a specific tiles that were either scanned or just uh, scattered on um, with some kind of uh, algorithm, which is really going to work to our advantage. So whenever we render such a wall, and uh, believe me, I rendered a many, many walls in my career, um, so I worked with 3ds Max for more than 15 years and just recently one of my students uh, showed me a model that I was using in m one of my um, uh, projects 12 years ago and this was a new finding for that student which was a huge leap into memory line uh, so down the memory line so I uh, highly appreciate those uh, small things that uh, really randomly can happen during our lessons. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, during our lessons, we are 
right about to start our materials. This Friday, we're going to have our first look into real world materials, uh, how to, uh, we're going to be working with uh, physical uh, properties of our maps, and we're going to have a lot of fun, uh, especially since we already opened that Pandora box. Uh, hello, Nicholas, nice to see you. Uh, Rail Clone also is a good option. Yes, but Rail Clone is absolutely backwards. I mean, using that software uh, requires you to, let's say, take at least two hours to understand the UI, then an hour to at least do your first project. You can use the presets, but you're not understanding what you're doing and you're always going to be dependent on whether it looks good or can I squint and pretend that I don't see the problem. Unless you really spend a lot of time to master it, that's really going to be amazing. But regardless, I believe that Rail Clone is a little bit of an overkill, especially when working with simple objects. So right now we can see that this whole uh, map is going to, or let's say this whole um, brick wall looks nice, but it's not necessarily going to serve the exact purpose that I wanted. Because you can see that most of the elements are absolutely flat in this texture. Although it has uh, all of those niceties like displacement, bumps, and whatever. Just so it's easier for me to do it, I'm going to skip my uh, tree planner map, which is by default going to be part of this texture, uh, or let's say this texture setup. So we're just going to skip this because we don't need it in this uh, regard. So let's just delete those. And we're all uh, already making this a little bit simpler. I know that this is not really going to be the best approach because we also need to make sure that our mapping is correct for objects like this. But as I said, whenever you will have your walls or your buildings, uh, some of the elements might, uh, might actually uh, look a little bit flat, especially when dealing with bricks. So, okay, uh, I'm going to show you a quick trick that's going to be probably very uh, interesting to some of you. And we're just going to move on to the next element uh, quite quickly. So, now, if you want to make sure that some of your bricks are going to stand out and you're going to be able to add individual damage without really remaking your whole, uh, your whole texture or adding some kind of specific decals, what we can do is, uh, first of all, make sure that our texture is being displayed in the viewport. Then we're going to do a caveman style modeling where I'm going to just uh, try to draw on my textures a few boxes like this. They don't necessarily need to be big, small, it's just about making sure that we're going to have a little bit of, uh, well, elements standing out. I'm not going to be uh, building all of my bricks because I just want to add some detail, uh, some small, uh, let's say, um, some small accent to every brick that I have in my scene. So we're going to just uh, do this small trick. And uh, thanks to the fact that our 3ds Max, uh, in, especially in version 2024, works absolutely marvelously, uh, we're going to do a nice, neat trick. So first, I'm going to add a UVW map, just the regular one, and I'm going to change it to Y x-axis, uh, z-axis. Which axis do I need? So Y axis, I was actually right the first time. So we're going to copy this and convert our object into editable poly. So this way, I'm going to be able to do a little bit of tricks. But before I really do something about it, I need to make sure that all of my bricks are going to be well taken care of. Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is go for subdivide. So subdivide is going to allow me to get a little bit of extra geometry at this point. Uh, think about those bricks as small objects with a little bit of detail that we're only going to be introducing to them. So let's just make sure to add some noise on top of that, because I want to make sure that some of those bricks are going to be damaged, some of them are going to uh, look uh, a little bit older, or maybe your mason wasn't really that great, and we had a few problems along the way. Maybe somebody threw something against the wall and, uh, well, it didn't really last. Or maybe you were trying to uh, hang a picture on your wall and again, it didn't turn out that great. So you're going to lose your deposit. Regardless what the story behind that is, 
you most likely want to make sure that you also make this believable. So I'm going to lower the noise li limit and we're going to have a little bit of fun with this object. So first of all, I'm going to decide which elements are going to be in and which are going to be out. Uh, so just for the sake of it, I'm going to make sure to take two by the two or three by three modifier and just take, let's say half of this brick out. So it's going to be slightly damaged. And now the fun begins because now I'm going to add the Boolean modifier. Boolean as a modifier is only available for 2024. But if you're going to be rocking ver older versions like 2012, like somebody in the audience is, you can just go to our compound objects like uh, right here and just select the Pro Boolean, which is going to be part of your 3ds Max. So what I'm going to do now is go for Union. Okay, this one stands out a little bit too much. Uh, so I you know what, I'm just going to put it here and this one here. So now what we're going to be doing is going for union, and we start picking our objects one by one, we're going to be applying those elements into our um, wall. Also, since we created this one, uh, for a little bit of damage, I'm going to make sure to take this one out. Please notice that right now we are doing a little bit of extrusion on this wall, but also we're adding a bit of detail. And yes, this is not going to be the perfect solution. And I never said it is, uh, it is going to be, but it is going to be definitely a perfect way of adding a little bit of something extra into your textures and into your walls just by a few clicks and uh, by using the booleans and your unit in unifying everything, it is going to ensure that uh, you're never going to run into any glitches. And thanks to the fact that we added those small details, you can see that one of the bricks literally has a hole in, the, in it, which looks absolutely uh, fabulous. And we've got a few bricks that stand out because somebody wasn't uh, really uh, that good uh, when laying bricks. And that really will m break the patterns in your textures because you're going to be able to add those individual bricks from time to time. Also, what you can do is uh, not use Boolean and just apply the UVW mapping once you up, uh, add the elements into your stock. But I prefer using Union uh, because really it's going to be uh, more fun uh, because right now 3ds Max has this amazing option where you can grab your bricks and just copy the elements that are going to be part of your already um, created Boolean. So what I can do is just move those bricks, copy them, add new, or just scale anything I want. Uh, so this is going to work absolutely amazing because you can see that I am literally changing the way this uh, whole wall operates which is going to be fun. And as I said, we're not doing this to uh, change the whole wall, just to add a little bit of detail for your interior once it is a little bit boring, or it has a little bit too many elements in it. So this is my method number one that I wanted to share with you today. But now we're quickly going to move on to the next one. Uh, so uh, let's uh, uh, okay, so let's read the chat for a while. Uh, do you think about Blender versus uh, 3ds Max? So although Blender is getting better and better, I am not yet convinced into using it. The reason for it is Blender tries to be everything at the same time. It tries to create animation, it tries to be sculpting software, it tries to be um, pretty much every piece of equipment for 3D designer that there is which to some extent it does, uh, it really works um, quite well. But none of the tools is, I would say, high level, because if we compare the options of sculpting that you have in, um, in Blender versus other software that is specifically built for that purpose, Blender lays flat if we compare the speed of rendering on most of the engines that are built for uh, 3ds Max Verse Blender, again, Blender loses, and so on and so forth. And um, I know that Blender has a lot of merits, but I am not yet convinced uh, for uh, to it. Be well, I am not yet convinced. That's going to be what I'm going to say about Blender. It's great. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not for me yet. 
uh okay i am so excited to watch that live andrew thank you thank you hi from turkey hello hello uh Bahnan, it's really nice to see you uh so love from pakistan really amazing thank you thank you javad uh, javad uh, sorry guys i am so sorry with uh, my pronunciation you're probably going to hate me but i'm trying my best uh so meanwhile guys if you have any questions feel free to ask as many as you want uh, i'm going to try to answer all of them because it's going to be uh well something that you're going to enjoy as for now does the Viz academy teach rain clone or forest pack we kind of do but honestly this is not the uh, core of our curriculum we're going to create additional videos on that at some point but uh, this is not yet part of our curriculum what we use instead is built-in options that are available in 3ds max or corona renderer although forest pack is really good i don't think it's fair to give my students another um let's say requirement to start um to start being professional you have to buy this that that and that that's really not going to be fair and i prefer to show them uh, more capable tools that are already built in the, the software instead of um, telling them to buy this thing because it has presets uh, so that's not what I would like to learn when I would be starting. Uh, so now let's uh, talk a little bit about this type of wall and how can we build it in 3ds Max exactly. Uh, so whenever you want to cr create your bricks, uh, you probably will uh, try to create a simple plane uh, in your 3ds Max, add a texture and that's it. And uh, adding it to something like this, might be disastrous because you're going to try to do extrude extrude the object okay this was weird let's just make sure to reset the x form for this element and try to actually extrude it upwards so okay uh, you're probably going to have a wall like this at some point because you're going to be building palaces um okay so let's try to uh, make sure that it goes up if i'm going to add a texture to it you're probably going to um notice that well regular mapping is going to be a bit tedious because you're going to run into uh, some problems with the map some of the bricks are going to stretch out and going for cylindrical may not necessarily be the right approach, especially in your case, because not everything is going to be that easy. You could split your mapping into five different elements, which is going to be fine, and you're probably going to uh, need to do it at some point for some elements. But what if you need the spaces between your bricks that's when this problem is going to really uh, be a little bit um, i would say uh, intense so first thing i going i typically do for objects like this is convert the object to a double spline um, but okay now one step back now let's imagine that we first have our wall so let's convert this wall into a editable poly that's the important part here now since i have this wall i'm going to uh, need to make sure that i'm able to add my bricks on this whole surface so the easiest and fastest way to do it for me is to double click and just select the whole bottom so this way i'm going to have this edge at the bottom selected now to make sure that I'm going to be able to apply the changes or the objects that I want into my wall, I'm going to go ahead and create shape from selection. That's going to be a linear uh, shape because I uh, prefer to use linear. Um, a lot of times you're going to have to, uh, to fix a lot of the smoothing, so I just prefer to do it this way. Okay, Mike, can we use projection mapping for, uh, for texturing? Uh, yes, we can use projection mapping, but it all depends uh, what you mean by that. If you want to use baking for that, we can use this. If you want to use the projection map that literally projects the map out of your uh, camera, that's a little bit different tutorial that I'm really open to discussing with you if you want to see how to project the map exactly uh, onto the objects. But from the point of view of your camera that's a um, that's something that not a lot of people really need in arcvis 
Sir, thank you for everything you do uh, for us. I am from Saudi Arabia. Love your work style. Thank you very much. That's so nice of you. Uh, okay, let's continue. Um, how would uh, the process of creating bricks arch would be like the top of a door or a curved tunnel ceiling? Peter, thank you for that question. We're literally going to do that, do that now. So uh, since we've got this beautiful element here, we're going to go ahead and add floor generator. So yes, floor generator, although I promised we can, we can use different techniques, I am first going to show you this using floor generator, then we're going to move to a different technique. So you're going to definitely enjoy it. So we've got our floor generator, but you may have noticed that for a moment, I went to our utilities. Here, I went to measure and I did a magical uh, thing that nobody really does. I went to our shapes and here you've got the length of your shape. So it's around 270 centimeters in the length, the whole shape that I've created. This is going to help me to create my uh, my bricks because this way I can go back to my plane and type in the same width for my object. So whenever I will be projecting my object on top of this curvature, it is going to be slightly easier for me to not stretch all, all of my bricks. So it's going to be more consistent overall. So what I'm going to do now is select my shape again. So let's hide this uh, icky object. And now, since this is going to be my base, all I need to do is go to floor generator, go to path the form. Remember that whenever you will be using path the form, you definitely do not want to use world scale modifiers. I do not understand why do they keep world scale or scale modifiers in 3ds max, they are so buggy. And I just literally hate them. Uh, so I would definitely uh, risk even saying that somebody was too lazy to delete them. So whenever we want to use path to form, you probably will have to check what axis you really want to use. In some cases, you may also need to use uh, the rotation amount, because not every time everything, uh, not every object is going to be obviously rotated. As you noticed, my plane was rotated a little bit differently on the y axis, which made sense. But this is not what I'm looking for. So I need to change into x axis. But at the same time, I need to use the 90 degrees option. Although this is not going to be perfect for me because you can see that we're looking at the back of our bricks. But can we fix this? Yes, really quickly by adding cap holes. So it's a modifier that will allow you to literally do what it, does, what it says. So it's going to cap all of the holes. So it's going to be easier for us. And we're not going to need to flip everything. Um, and it's just going to be nonsense free. We could just avoid this by adding 270, which would be an option for us. But again, uh, if you just want to make sure that nobody is going to see the back of your brick, uh, because that's embarrassing, uh, it is going to be definitely better to just add the modifier and be done with it. It also will have well, way more merits to it. Next, since we started with a, a simple plane, we're going to be able to add our bricks into, um, or let's say, um, project our bricks onto our curvature without really thinking about it. Well, there is some element that you may want to take a notice on, and that's going to be hard edges. So whenever we're going to have 90 degrees turns like I have right here um, to fix it if it's going to be a problem. Obviously, you may want to split those into two separate elements and then add them separately. I don't typically do it because I find this to be a huge waste of time um, because nobody is going to notice most of uh, the, uh, let's say, small shortcuts that I take. So I just take them and uh, ignore all the rest. But now we also want to add the holes in between. And sometimes this is going to be extremely important for the project. <clears throat> so how do we do that? Well, obviously, we're going to make sure to go back to our floor generator. And this is the beauty of this method, because we can just uh, unlock our um, distances and just add a little bit of that in between. 
So this way, we're going to be able to create multiple objects without really thinking about it. And it's going to be fast, easy and nonsense free. If we want to, we can also add the rest of the, uh, let's say, changes that we did previously. So uh, we can select a few of the elements, add the bricks, um, add noise to those bricks and damage them. But that's going to really require us as, uh, to have a purpose in that. And a good purpose could be a scene created by our student Magdalena. Uh, so whenever you will be, um, by the way, uh, sorry, that's Maugojata. Uh, so, um, um, okay, Maugojata, thank you very much for sending your scene. Uh, so this beautiful scene was created by our student in just a few days. So it's not that we spend seven weeks on building one scene. No, we typically create multiple scenes with our students and uh, I can pretty much vouch for it that right now our students are creating multiple scenes and some of our students are right now in our audience. So um, those of you, oh, hello, Atar, uh, nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you. Hope you are, uh, you and the team are doing well. Uh, great to see you. So by the way, about my students, so Atar was also uh, one of my students. Uh, so it's so nice to see you. Um, okay. Hi from uh, Pakistan. Really nice. Uh, what uh, do you think about doing the basic modeling in AutoCAD and then importing in 3ds Max in such a uh, it is uh, much easier to model the basic in AutoCAD. So to be honest, it all depends on what uh, uh, software you feel more comfortable with. If uh, you are a little bit better with AutoCAD and you think you can work faster there, go for it. Because uh, 3ds Max is going to be able to digest almost everything, even Rhino files. So it's not going to be a problem at all as long as you know what you're doing. So you're going to have to perfect your uh, workflow with, let's say, angle that's going to be aimed at 3ds Max import. So as long as you're going to be able to figure that out, I see absolutely no problem with this. And I would even recommend this kind of workflow because whatever software you feel more, mo most comfortable with is going to be the best idea for you. Um, hi, how are you? Um, um, I am from Bangladesh. Nice. Uh, thank you. I am really uh, great. Hi, chat from Australia. I actually lied. It's Austria. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Joe, sorry for that. Uh, hi, brother. I'm from India. What will happen for the object if we choose compress and save rather than normal uh, save? Uh, thank you for the question. So, again, it's one of those questions that we have to answer um, live. So uh, what will happen? First of all, we can go to preferences and see uh, what kind of uh, file handling we can go for. So compress and save, if I recall correctly, should be somewhere in the files. Uh, so uh, convert, compress on save. That's what you mean most likely. So long story short, what's going to uh, happen is that your file is literally going to be compressed while saving. So right now you can see that the default file is taking almost one gigabyte because when I was preparing this file for the webinar, I was a little bit, I would say, generous with all of my polygons. And so don't look at it, uh, guys. I'm going to be talking about the limits of polygons with my students a lot. Uh, so I'm kind of breaking my own uh, my own idea of it. But uh, regardless, let's just test what happens when we compress on save. First of all, with older versions of 3ds Max, and I mean versions 2023 and down, uh, you're going to probably notice a huge, huge slowdown when saving your files. But if you're going to save, uh, compress on save, you can see that my file now, while compressed, although uh, the save took um, let's say three times longer. So it was 15 seconds instead of five. It actually is a way lighter file. It is also going to open slightly longer, but with newest 3ds Max, and I mean 2024 and the actually 2023 also does this. So I mean, in reality, it's going to be only 2022 and down. So 2023 actually also will be faster. So compress and say, 
compresses this file, it uh, takes a little bit less space on your drive. So it means that it's going to work way better. Uh, so hope this answers your question. Uh, hello from Uzbekistan. Uh, hello from Saudi Arabia. Uh, yep, student here. <laughs> yep, Ricardo, I had noticed. Oh, uh, sir, thank you for ever. Okay. Uh, can okay, texturing or applying to uh, thank you f uh, so much for applying to my answer. Uh, hugs from Mexico City. Uh, great, thank you for that. Uh, India, uh, really great. Um, so, um, let's see. How much uh, salary students get when they are hired by a studio? So this is one of those questions that I kind of reserve for my students because uh, this is going to be one of those insider knowledge uh, type of topics that we kind of give out to our students during the training. Uh, we, we will be also organizing some special event for our past students uh, because I am doing quite a lot of the research on the market. So we're going to be doing the same webinar as this one, but behind the closed doors um, um, where you are going to have to register for. So it's going to be one of those things I absolutely will just tell you to, it's a secret. No, honestly, it's not, but uh, it's something that I would rather discuss with our students. Uh, so uh, hello from Brazil, hello from India. How do we lock Corona interactive to a window so when we isolate elements it doesn't isolate them in the IR render answer but just in the viewport uh, so depending what that question really was supposed to mean uh, so what I'm guessing you're trying to uh, say is how do we make sure that whenever we uh, select our elements or let's say we start using interactive render uh, how do we make sure that when selecting a different viewport, our viewport does not jump from one to another? So, for example, I'm going to now uh, destroy uh, what I have in a second. So let's just go. Um, it's very simple. You go to render setup, click on this uh, small locker. And uh, this way, when it's unlocked, you're going to be jumping from one view to another. But if we're going to uh, lock this view, clicking here, you're going to make sure that whatever viewport you're going to be using, it is going to be locked and steady with your workflow. And so let's go back to our lesson now. Hello from India. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you. Hello from Colombia, Chile. Uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, you're welcome. I have a query. How um, high does the temperature of your processor reach when rendering in Corona? I have i9 and something something and it reaches 92 degrees. Is it normal when rendering in Corona? It's not about rendering in Corona. It's about is it normal for this type of processor? So, and this is a very technical question, so I don't want to sound like a huge nerd, but long story short, it all depends on your processor's capability. Uh, to be honest, to, uh, 92 degrees sounds like a lot, but my computer reaches in 89 degrees when I am rendering. So, uh, it all depends on your hardware and what temperature the processor still feels comfortable working with and no it's not going to burn your computer it's very 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 highly unlikely because uh, your bios or so let your motherboard more your motherboard has a built-in safety net so if your temperature is going to reach um, a little bit too high numbers it is either going to um, slow down the processor's uh, speed, so it's called throttling, or it's going to reset because it de definitely doesn't want to burn. So it's not a problem. But it might be a good idea to think about um, a little bit better cooling in your computer. Uh, so as I was saying, um, we're going to also uh, have to create a nice material because uh, this example is not going to accept a regular texture because if we're going to just project a texture like this one on a brick like that, it is well unlike it is going to be unlikely that we're going to be able to um, have be lucky enough to be able to project the texture the right way. Also, uh, we could do it um, on a flat surface and then move this. But uh, as I said, it's better to just prepare a special texture for our objects. Uh, so 
uh, let's just make sure uh, to create that material together. Uh, so I'm going to sh show you a step-by-step -step, solution that I use for this kind of situations. But uh, I also need to give you a small heads up that I'm going to show you this material and how I prepare it uh, with a very simple technique that's going to be enough. And it was used in this scene once I got my hands on it. But this was the original material. So our students are going to be kind of bit in, uh, let's say, advantage over what we do here on YouTube. So um, you're not going to be uh, that much behind because if you're going to create something like this, you're definitely going to uh, have beautiful results because I know that whenever you will be working on your shots, you will definitely have a little bit of knowledge of your own. But you can also visit our previous videos and just follow those as we kind of covered the full process of doing the visuals. Uh, so uh, from India, hello, um, nice to see you. What processor do you have? I'm using um, three computers at the moment, so uh, I am a big fan of AMD, but there's really no difference in AMD and Intel. When it comes to my uh, choices, I typically choose AMD because of the price point, um, but the Intel's, uh, so, uh, Intel hardware is just as good, although it tends to be a little bit more expensive. So what I'm using right now is Ryzen 9, Ryzen 9 and uh, Threadripper 2970WX. I don't remember exactly the name because I stopped really caring about this um, as soon as I actually reached the point which satisfies me um, and makes my work, um, let's say, uh, fluent and uh, nonsense free where I don't have to wait a few minutes for another click. So uh, thread rippers are really great at it. But if I would be choosing another hardware, uh, a new computer for me, I would probably just settle for Ryzen 9, one of the newest models, because they really tend to be great. But the uh, processor that uh, Sergio uh, um, t uh, told us about is actually also very good. So um, I would say the i9 and are also great. Um, when it comes to rendering. Um, I would definitely also recommend you to test what you can achieve with that um, processor um, on Corona Renderer website. That could be coronarenderer.com slash benchmark. Go to the user results and type in your processor. That way you're going to know exactly what, what to buy. Okay, so in my process of making this material, I'm going to start with absolutely bare bones material. So we're going to go for physical material and we're going to be using some kind of texture. This is one of the textures that uh, our students will receive um, throughout our training. So it's just a simple concrete texture that I find to be highly useful. I don't, I am not a fan of uh, storing a uh, gajillions of textures and browsing through them until you find the one perfect PBR texture that's designed for the weather at uh, Italy when it's summer. Because when you want to do something with the texture or move it slightly, you're going to run into huge problems and you're going to have to find the one that's going to be working on Tuesdays and you're out of that texture. So because PBR textures can have that small problem, I tend to just create a simple uh, run of the mill textures out of the simplest materials. So now this is going to be a simple concrete texture. As you can see, it's not too big, not too small. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just plug it into Corona Color Correction. This is a map that comes um, as a built in with Corona. So it's the simplest one you can really imagine. Then we're going to plug it in into our base color. So this is going to be the basic process of creating our textures. Most of the materials that we create are going to be super simple because, as I said, I just don't want to complicate anything when it's not necessary. But sometimes you just want to show off and do a combo, uh, which we can also try at some point. So if I'm going to right click, uh, we can go to open a preview window and we're going to see that it, this concrete looks pretty fine. When it comes to roughness, I want to make sure that my 
uh, nice bricks are going to be softly polished. So I'm going to add a little bit of that roughness. So we're talking about the modern bricks. So I want to make sure that what we're going to be dealing with is a nice highlight, a little bit of reflection, just a little bit of it. As you can see here, uh, all the bricks will have some of it. So it's not really that we're going to be building objects that are coarse and rough like sand. We're going to add a little bit of it. Maybe I actually went a little bit too far. So a little bit of roughness, but not too much because we're doing modern uh, textures. Uh, so, uh, my slate material editor doesn't look like uh, this. Can you inform um, about this? So, uh, Talia, this is because you're using an older version of 3ds Max. In 3ds Max 2024, they kind of changed the UI, but the overall idea is exactly the same. They only made it a little bit more new and a little bit newer. If you want to, you can watch our previous video on uh, previous videos or webinars on uh, 3ds Max 2024, where I really extensively explained the change in the material editor. It's a nothing burger when it comes to really opening this. It's going to be, oh, this looks like this now. Okay, that's all. But my suggestion for you is go to Mo, um, model modes and always disable dockable because if you're going to be using your material editor and you're going to be sloppy like me at some point moving it you're this is just 3ds max whenever i am trying to mess up something it doesn't allow me to but when i'm not trying to it will so anyway dockability of your material editor can be a huge problem when you don't know what to do with it but uh, if you disable it it's going to act almost exactly the same as normal so open preview window it's probably oh yeah this one is going to be annoying see uh, so sometimes this is going to happen so avoid it because uh, docking your material preview might be a bit problematic uh, so um if an object is made by three uh, objects, should I attach them to a group them together is the best way to clean the scene. I'm not sure what you mean exactly. So I would love to dive into that question, but I'm absolutely not sure what you mean. Mike, every new version of Corona, they add new features, but speed of uh, doesn't increase. Why? It does increase, but... Um, the problem is that whenever you, uh, as a user, notice that your render goes a little bit faster, you're going to throw a little bit more items at your rendering engine. Before, when 3ds Max and Corona were just kind of uh, starting, I mean, Corona was a new software, I was using a lot of tricks that were, uh, let's say, kind of all over the place, overrides, tricks, uh, fakes, all of that, I had to use a lot of them in order to keep my rendering speed um, up to date. But right now, I absolutely do the opposite. I make the rendering a little bit harder for my computer because I throw more at it. So it does increase uh, the speed and you can compare your old scenes uh, with old um, version of uh, Corona with, well, newer version. And I promise you, it is way faster. Also, it handles RAM way better. Uh, those are just things that we don't notice, but uh, whenever you will be working with bigger scenes and b bigger projects, you're going to really notice the difference because um, it just handles files better. Uh, so that's not necessarily through what you said. It's just that some of the changes are very circumstantial and you cannot really notice the difference until you would actually run into this uh, problem in the previous versions. Uh, so it's going to be easier to notice those if you actually go back. Uh, so um, what GPU do you have? Um, have you tried F-Storm? Uh, from my experience, it's way faster and easier to work with um, than a CPU-based rendering engines. So uh, Rebel, thank you for that question. So F-Storm, if I recall correctly, that's software created by no, Tyson creates the mm, T uh, Tie Flow. Uh, so, mm, okay. So as for the App Store, it's amazing software. But I did my comparisons, and when it comes to speed comparison and quality, 
I would say Corona is uh, almost the same speed. It's literally the same thing. Uh, I have a friend that works, uh, creates beautiful interiors in AppStorm, so I'm not ragging on it. It's perfect. It's, I mean, it's really good. But uh, speed comparison when it came to, let's say, details of glass, uh, some caustics, some details that only, let's say, professionals can uh, go into, I would say that Corona wins on every surface, but when it comes to just regular workflow, there's almost no difference. And it, on, let's say, um, lower level, it is even faster. So I would say that uh, if you're qual if you're satisfied with slightly lower quality and but uh, vastly uh, faster rendering, it's going to be good to switch to F Storm. But I am always for quality, but also speed. So I pick Corona. Uh, so um, when I should use physical material and legacy. So legacy material is mostly going to be now used for more artistic approach because in legacy material, what you can do with your materials is, for example, glass that's also metal. So that's Im physically impossible. Also, you can create objects that are transparent, but also refractive, which kind of makes sense. But you know, uh, it just is going to do what you allow it to or what you want it to do, while physical material is way smarter. So if you're going to be going for metal, it's going to say, hey, you know what, there is no such thing as metallic um, glass. So this is cool because it's um, making the whole process of working with Corona so much easier and it's so much easier to understand every material. So it's kind of better um, because it's just uh, going to be bulletproof. And I really love to use bulletproof materials that cannot be broken. Okay, so going back to our materials, uh, let's just create the simplest material ever. So the texture, then Corona color correction. And since we want to add this uh, simple material, now we're going to go for tint and we're going to look for the right color. In many cases, you want to go for just super red red, but I'm just going to try to find the right uh, hue of it. So in this case, uh, something around nine is going to be my sweet spot. And when it comes to our saturation, at first I'm going to go a little bit overboard, overboard but uh, now we're going to select as many elements as we can and just make sure, okay, this 3 doesn't need to be made out of, of the brick. Uh, so we're just going to apply this material and see how it renders. We're probably going to go back and increase some gamma, but you're going to notice that it's surprisingly good looking, um, considering that it's just one texture. We could add all of those niceties, okay. So it's, as I said, surprisingly good looking, uh, but it's way too dark. So in order to have full control of what I want to do and uh, get exactly the, the result I want, I'm going to go back to my Chronicle Correct and either play with brightness or gamma. The difference between the two is going to be explained to my students this uh, Friday. Uh, so please hold on, but we're going to just add a little bit of gamma. Actually, I went overboard with this one. Let's go for 1.7. And this should be almost perfect uh, for what I need. So uh, when it comes to our brick material, this is going to be a bulletproof material that's going to be really something that we can add to our bigger chunk of bricks and just use it the way we want. But I also mentioned that we're not going to necessarily resort to building our all of our bricks using just floor generators. So how about we talk about some plugins? Uh, so one of the plugins that um, I strongly recommend you to use from at least time to time is scripts. And let's see. OK, um, what was it? Um, Debris, Debris, Debris Maker 2. So when it comes to Debris Maker, it's a software that you can get from about, okay, so let's, uh, Debris Maker, uh, da, 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 da. So just a quick plug. Um, it's just for the fact that I use this software and I really love it. So because I do, I'm going to. 
Uh, so bricks, we select what we want to do, which is funny because once you start the software, you have to select what you want to do and then the UR shows, which is fun because uh, at first it's going to be confusing what uh, it just doesn't show what you want to do. So um, when it comes to bricks, I prefer to use the Bree Maker because again, it's something that's just fast. So uh, we decide how much erosion we want uh, on our bricks. So let's just first generate a few bricks uh, out of the blue. So those are going to be just plain generic bricks. Uh, so you can see that they will have a little bit of damage. Uh, you can pick out of three different options, which in reality, I wouldn't call too great because uh, the third one is going to often have this problem with uh, the smoothing groups. So if this happens, you want to add as a smoothing group a mod a modifier to clear this out. Otherwise, you're going to have a bit of a bad time. But if we're going to use those bricks, we might as well just go ahead and go for irregularity, a little bit of erosion, a few more bricks. Let's create 10. And we don't want to click on high poly because we're just going to be doing walls. And now you can see that my bricks are absolutely amazing. The reason for this amazing part is that uh, those bricks are going to have a little bit of unique damage. You don't need to uh, use um, only those damaged, but uh, we're going to definitely make sure to mark them. So object one damaged, and we're going to go for object uh, this one also damaged. So this is going to be important for us in a second. Um, because we're now going to be applying the same premises we did a second ago. Okay, um, this is a bit more nuanced and you may want to optimize this object if it's going to be only one surface. So deleting part of this brick could be a good idea, but it's not going to be necessary. So um, by the way, I didn't show you the funniest element of this uh, whole setup is that we can go for ma masonry and we can just select whatever shape we want and create something really nice, quickly creating walls, which we will be able to uh, uh, just use for our, um, well, to our advantage. So let's go for wall width, let's go for 20, wall height, let's go for 30. And we're just going to go for a little bit less uh, erosion. And then we're going to go for no special rows. So in order to avoid them, we have to give a bigger number than the wall height. And unfortunately, it doesn't allow us to because well, it's a limited software. So we're going to see that special rows are typically uh, not going to be visible in this type um, of, um, let's say wall, but it is going to be visible in different uh, type of walls, because it's going to rotate some of those uh, bricks and well, it's going to produce a different uh, outcome. So now we've got this wall made out of 600 tiles. So obviously, we can just attach all of them together to make a huge object that's going to be a bit uh, overwhelming for our uh, software, but it's still going to be easy to use with the same techniques that we went for a second ago. It is going to take us a few seconds to attach all of those elements. And uh, one thing that I need to give you a heads up, if we're not going to optimize our bricks, and I mean that Debris Maker is going to have a bit of excessive mesh in it, we're probably going to run into some issues. And because it's a live webinar, I obviously had to go for two big numbers and two, um, two fast clickety clicks. So for that reason, I'm going to probably resort, resort to actually hating myself or not paying attention to what I did. So this is the reason why it, uh, why it uh, took so long. So um, I didn't really expect it to be made out of uh, instances. So let's just reattach this again without the instances so that now it's going to be a bit faster. Okay, uh, will this stream be uh, will this stream survive? I hope so. Uh, we're going to upload it to our YouTube uh, right after we're finished. Uh, so now we've uh, got this wall. And we're going to do exactly the same thing we did previously. So we're going to be able to go for path deform, add it in, and we're going to just apply it to our wall on the right axis. It depends on what axis we want. Uh, so let's go for 50% at least. Now amount 90 degrees. And we're going to uh, notice that we've got really nice setup as always. 
Although the reason why we can see a little bit of a problem here is our objects, uh, let's say, mm, mm, uh, vertices. So our uh, bricks are going to try to mimic exactly what our object is made out of. So in order to really uh, have the smoothest possible, op uh, smoothest possible um, wall, we're going to need to make sure that we also uh, optimize the spline. So uh, let's go for optimize um, spline, optimize, optimize spline. Okay. And in this case, if we're going to optimize it a little bit, we're going to notice that it just gets better because we removed unnecessary knots in our uh, spline. So it got smoothed out. It is going to be a good thing to have this uh, somewhere at your disposal, just for the sake of making sure that your brick walls are going to be just as soft as those that I've uh, created with you. But let's explore this um, beautiful um, model for a little bit longer. Because there's one thing I haven't yet uh, shown you or told you about before we really go. Uh, so this or whenever you want to create bricks or any kind of details in your um, in your um, exteriors, you want to go for one special element. And that is going to be your uh, offset general minimum with where is it? Okay, so we've got our minimum and maximum offset, but that's no oh, sorry, tilt. The tilt is what we really want to go for whenever we create bricks. And that's the secret sauce that I really want you to start using, at least right now. <laughs> okay, so whenever you will have a little bit of tilt in your bricks, you're going to notice that they just look better. Not don't go for some crazy values of 12 or 15. It's just about one millimeter, one centimeter, something like that. Two is plenty. But if we're going to render something like this with our textures and our elements already um, having all of those niceties added, it is just going to make all of the elements look so much more realistic, so much more believable, because we're going to see that our reflections are going to grab slightly different angles. And for that reason, we're going to have much more believable looks when we will be working with our scenes. So this is pretty much the basics of bricks and what I would be uh, suggesting you to use whenever you will be uh, using your bricks on arches, on uh, curved walls, on some kind of fancy shapes, and also how to create a bulletproof or at least basis for a bulletproof um, material. Um, Mike, um, now I'm going to take a few questions and uh, if we run out of questions, we're going to uh, just skedaddle. So um, this would be pretty much all I wanted to show you for today's webinar. Also next week, we're going to create an exterior that's going to be quite exciting. Uh, so um, buckle up because there's going to be quite a lot of fun uh, ahead of us. So another from zero to hero uh, tutorial is coming up. But this time we're going to prepare even more materials for you. Uh, so uh, Mike, how can we improve pro productivity with dual monitor? Can you explain how you can uh, you use them? Uh, Asim, thank you. So I actually use three screens on my in my case. So what I do is I make sure to have my uh, main screen with my uh, 3ds max and another dirty trick that i use a lot is my x key then i type in um wait a second uh floating viewport and by making sure that i've got this floating viewport you're going to notice that we've got a special something going on because i can just select my um whichever um, camera I want and just place it on one of my screens. So this way, I'm going to be able to have my whole viewport just laid out for me. I wish I could show you this, but I unfortunately can't move my camera. But long story short, this is going to be just one way of showing uh, your viewport. Plus, there is a hack that I found. Uh, sometimes you want to render smaller than the smallest possible render uh, window for your video frame buffer because you just want to see some fast action. And this is going to, let's say, take five, six seconds to compute. 
once your t uh, tone mapping, bloom and glare, and everything else is set up perfectly, what you can do is uh, create this um, floating viewport as small or as, or as big as you want, and then just type, uh, click on render in the viewport, and that's going to allow you to create a smaller and faster render just to see the preview even faster without really doing anything about it. It's a fun little trick that I use a lot. Next way of absolutely making your workflow even better is not opening YouTube when working. I really mean it. Make sure that you focus on your work when you're doing it. Don't, uh, I personally don't uh, listen to uh, that much music um, uh, during my work because I want to streamline uh, what I'm doing. Also, a next thing that I do with my third screen is I have all of my notes, so stickies and all of that are just laid out on the screen. This is going to help me track my progress. Also, because we need a little bit of sanity, I also make sure to put some kind of alarm clock that it tells me to take breaks. I know that it sounds like I am some kind of a wolf of Wall Street trying to do some kind of crazy work. No, it's just that I get into the zone because I really lo love what I'm doing. And when I'm doing it, I can get carried away and I kind of... Uh, lose track of time. So in order to take healthy breaks, drink some water and actually uh, feel better after I'm done working, because if you're going to overdo it, you're going to regret it and you just don't want to do that. Uh, it's going to be best to just stay healthy. Uh, but I think everybody knows that. Uh, so where's my... Okay. Um, by the way, where's... Uh, Really helpful tips. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mike, I wanted to ask about animation production size. How big do you usually produce your frames and noise or pass limits uh, for final work? So it all depends on the project, obviously. So it's um, not going to be dependent on what I want, but what my client can pay for. When it comes to animation, I just give them a budget uh, that's going... If you want to have video that's going to be this big, it's going to cost you that much. If you want a smaller size and a bit less frames, that's going to be this much. Uh, I typically just play open cards with my clients and show them how much does it cost to render uh, something on a render farm. I'm not playing uh, some kind of game where we're going to be uh, playing poker and um, pretending that um, we're trying to trick one another. No, I always make it absolutely clear that I'm cooperating with my client and my client's success is my success. So I try to be as much uh, of a help when I work on projects as I can. So I never do any kind of mystery, um, well, let's say mystery pricing. I just... Uh, I am open with my clients. Uh, my scene just can't open. I, it says failed to open the file. It happens two or three times. So uh, Mihir, uh, Mihir, once this happens, try to go to File, Import, and go to Import Merge. If you're going to be merging your file, make sure to click only half of the files that are going to be on the list. So if the first half fails, try the other half. If both halves fail, you kind of don't have a lot of luck. Uh, try to do a smaller portion, uh, maybe one or two models, but if something loads, just one model at a time, it is, it's going to mean that only one object is corrupted. But if, uh, let's say, half of your models will load, you're going to then try the other half. And uh, this way, we're going to be able to narrow down which model is going to be faulty and you may actually get to the point where your file is going to work. But first of all, check out if you have your auto backup because that's really going to be the best solution. Um, is this floor generator built into 3ds Max? No, you can get it from CG Source uh, website and it, there's a free version, um, but because it's very useful, I recommend you to just purchase it. Uh, it's not that expensive and it's the one of the most downloaded plugins for 3ds max ever uh, so uh, hello mike thanks for the stream amazing as always i have two questions for you what's the resolution size for textures on production 2k and 4k 
8K. So nice question. Um, whenever you want to render something, you think in very specific terms. Uh, so in my case, when I know that I'm going to be rendering something that's going to be 2K, it all depends on how much space or how many pixels this texture is going to be taking in my on my screen. So I try to make sure that whenever I use some texture and it's going to, for example, be a bigger image, I just try to calculate if uh, this surface is going to be, let's say, 100, uh, one centimeter and it's going to be 100 pixels. I know that I need approximately uh, 200 pixels for this uh, texture to look good because when it's going to be squished and, squ and uh, stretched on a surface like that, I want to make sure that the pixels density is going to allow uh, this texture to look good. So typically, if you're going to create something that's going to be really large, you want to have to be absolutely safe. And I mean it uh, when you're working with close up, uh, close ups, even you want to have either the same resolution textures as your um, final product, or just uh, make sure that you have at least two up to four pixels per pixel in your image on a texture. So if this would be a texture that's going to take uh, approximately 100, um, let's say this is 20 by 20 pixels, right? Just imagine. So I would go for a texture that's going to be at least 40 by 40 pixels. It's uh, something like that or twice as much uh, just for the quality sake. How can I use perspective match with a uh, Corona camera? Um, you just need to disable your target and you can just go for it. Um, so perspective match is part of our training. So I would kind of drop some hints. <laughs> if you want to join our training, make sure to visit uh, Viz Academy Co UK and make sure to check the available dates. As always, we're in high demand. So if you want to uh, grab your seat, please hurry up because we're running out of spots for the next term. Obviously, if you will uh, uh, grab your seat right now, you're probably going to be able to also start our chat a little bit earlier. And those chats are only available for our students where we can um, exchange some extra questions. Uh, meanwhile, obviously, our full support is only available for those students that uh, for those groups that are in progress. Full support means that we um, help our students by answering their question on chat seven days a week in our working hours. So honestly, it's a lot of opportunities to talk to professionals. And we've got seasoned, seasoned professionals that handle our support, plus our webinars that are going to be uh, hosted three times a week. Uh, so that's something that you can't miss because those freebies that we do here are just the tip of the iceberg. We try to dive into more topics during our uh, webinars as much as we can. And we also provide our students with uh, very helpful videos that guide you step by step with uh, on every topic that is currently on uh, our curriculum. Okay, thank you so much for uh, for your priceless time. Thank you, Asim. Very uh, very nice of you. I tried to merge. I didn't work. I didn't work. I had to recover the backup file. Backup is the best solution. If the scene uh, scenes every time I open render setup, it crashes. So if the render setup crashes your scene, it's actually good. Just reset your um, your render. Try to uh, oh, remerge the backup file and reset your settings. This way, you're, it's going to be easier because it obviously is part of the rendering engine that you're currently using. Maybe some file got corrupted. Maybe it's the HDRI you're using. Maybe it's just one of the directories that has some kind of special symbol. That can happen, and 3ds Max really hates special symbols and for some reason, um, letters that have uh, the extra uh, marks in it. Okay, when I put plants, uh, whether uh, plants uh, either through scatter or manual copy, it always uh, um, I'm always worried about overlapping um, the leaf. Is there a way to uh, overcome that? Um, yes, but that's going to be a little bit of uh, let's say two level solution. If we're going to really be worried about it, you have to probably use two scatters and make sure that they're going to have enough distance. 
a lot of times uh, adding plants using scatter unfortunately um, intersecting some of the elements that's just going to be part of our workflow although there are maps for example um, that one map that has the best name ever uh, so let's try to read it out loud together so it's chaos scatter <clears throat> Chaos Scatter Edge Trimming Map Texture Map. Uh, so, yeah, that one. You can use it as opacity map. So whenever you're going to be on some kind of borders uh, with your objects, there's going to be a chance that the elements are going to cut, although it's not going to exactly get rid of the intersection, uh, intersecting leaves. So it's, um, let's say, half of the solution. Um, uh, hello from Dominican Republic. What an amazing job. Keep it up. Thank you. Uh, okay, guys, I would say that this I'm taking the last question and this is going to be it for today. Uh, so, okay, uh, Renaud, uh, this may be a silly question. There's no silly questions unless you make it sound silly. Uh, but my tool's preferences, snapping, ro rotating angle, keep resetting each time I, clo I close and open 3ds Max by any chance. Have you, uh, do you have any idea um, how to fix it? So Renaud, what you can do first is make sure to delete the ini file for your user. Uh, so it's default, save your workflow. So it's going to be manage work uh, places and save your current uh, setup. So make sure that it, uh, it's there. Also, you have the default state and chances are that either uh, you're using multiple windows or multiple uh, instances of 3ds max so if you have multiple instances of 3ds max and you make some changes um, you're going to save the changes in window number one but then window number two is over is going to override those changes resetting them so if you're going to do that there's one reason why this happens the other one is that you're just not saving your progress let's say so you have to save your work uh, workplace and then load it if that resets the other solution might be that uh, some kind of other software like McAfee antivirus is just opening this software as a sandbox or um, other, um, let's say, antivirus. And it's being treated as, let's say, fresh version of 3ds Max each time. Uh, so it just uh, is that um, your 3ds Max is not allowed to even uh, make those save uh, points or there is just some kind of lock on that file. Resetting your, your Enu might be the solution. So reset Enu is going to be the easiest because we can now right click and reset layout. It's uh, going to be the easiest way of doing it uh, just so we can get to the uh, initial state and then start saving the elements. Uh, so uh, that was our last question. Uh, thank you, Viz Academy, all the webinars. Uh, it's Ezekiel from Kenya. I have learned a lot. Thank you. And uh, that was a huge pleasure to host this webinar for you. Also, uh, hello from Angola. You should use QuickTiles plugin. QuickTiles, yes, uh, there's a lot of plugins that we can use. And we're going to do a special webinar on plugins at some point so everybody can get the juiciest plugins on uh, their hands on the juiciest uh, plugins. Uh, there are and uh, remember keep on rendering hope that you learned something and we're going to see each other in a week so i'm waiting with anticipation thank you very much for showing up uh, once again see you and uh well remember uh, biz academy co uk oh by the way if you could please make sure to like and subscribe to this video it really helps us a lot make sure to uh, leave a like and it would be super appreciated if you could comment this greatly helps us and um, well it's all for you guys so if you're going to help us we're going to be motivated even further to create new topics for you thank you once again and see you in a week in a week <laughs> thank you bye bye